to the course. Today I'm going to talk, I'm going to apply game theory to very interesting things. Cars, auctions, I'm going to tell you how Google makes its money. Okay. First I want to make a small pause in honor of the people in Ukraine who are fighting for their freedom and for our freedom. So now let's go to serious stuff. I'm going to talk about game theory applications. The first one is car traffic. So we have games, we have players. The players are the drivers. And the strategies are the routes they take. And the payoff is the travel time. Actually the negative, right? Because you want to maximize payoff, minimize travel time. And we have something called the Brace. Brace is paradox, which means if you add roads to a network, then uh, the times can get slower. It's very strange. I think adding roads makes things better. Game theory tells you why. Okay. And then we talk about auctions, uh, the vente aux enchères. Players are the bidders, you bid for items. Okay. The strategies is how much you bid. Okay. And the payoff is what you gain when you win. Okay. So basically, how much less you pay compared to what the value of what you get. There's two kinds of auctions, and we'll show you, in fact, you will learn a lot about auctions. One is called first price sealed bid, the other one is called second price sealed bid, and you will understand a lot after that. Uh, Google makes all their money on this. Okay. okay, so let me start by talking about car traffic networks, and I'm just going to give you a simple example. So here's a transportation network. These are like uh, intersections. These are roads, and the numbers are the times, how many minutes you go when there's X number of cars. Okay, so this this road it's always taking 45 minutes. This road it takes more time if there are more cars. It's like a very narrow road. So the more cars, the more minutes. So if you have 1,000 cars, it will take 10 minutes. Okay, here also. 45 minutes, and here also x over 100. Assume now that you have 4,000 cars who want to go from A to B. Okay? So how much time? What should they do? So each car has a strategy, huh? It can go this way or this way. There's two moves in the game, huh? 4,000 cars. If they all go the upper route, then the time will be 4,000 divided by 100, which is 40 plus 45, 85 minutes. Okay. If they divide themselves evenly, 2,000 go this way, 2,000 go that way, then these will take 2,000 divided by 100, which is 20 minutes plus 45, 65 minutes, and the one on the bottom also 65 minutes, so the drivers will, will take 65 minutes, so 20 minutes less, okay, if they divide evenly. Okay, so you can see the idea how drivers should choose their paths. Okay, so we'll go to, this is a game, in game theory. Okay, players are the drivers. Each player's strategy is the route it takes. This is a simple one, huh? we only have two routes, but in real life, of course, you have many more. It's just a simple example. Huh? Each player has two strategies here, and the payoff is the negative of the time. Not because we want to maximize the payoff, we want to minimize the time. What can you say here? There's a huge number of players. Huh? If we have 4,000 cars, we have 4,000 players instead of two players. Huh? 
But that's not a problem. Every player still chooses a strategy. But the matrix, of course, is going to be a huge thing. Huh? It's not going to be simple two-dimensional matrix anymore. Huh? But it's still a game. So every player has a strategy. And there's a payoff depending on the strategies of all the players. And the question is, what is the best strategy? How should they play? Which is the, how should they make the route? And all the ideas of game theory are still good here. Uh, dominant strategies, mixed strategies, Nash equilibrium. It's, it's still good here. Okay. Okay. So how how does it work? Okay. So this game has Nash equilibrium. Uh, so if the players balance themselves. That means 2,000 go here, and 2,000 go there. That is a Nash equilibrium. Uh, what does that mean, it's a Nash equilibrium? Well, it means if the player changes the route, then they will be worse off. Huh? So, for example, if I have like this, so this is the, the path. Huh? I have 2,000 going this way, and 2,000 going this way. So what is a Nash equilibrium? So the Nash equilibrium means each player does the best response to the others. That means if the player, if one of the drivers changes their strategy, then it should be worse huh? if it's a Nash equilibrium. Each player is doing the best compared to the others. Okay, so for example, this guy here, if he goes the upward, so this is driver A. If the strategy is part of the 2000 going on the upward route, the time will be 2000 over 100 plus 4500. But if this one changes and all the rest does the same, then we get 1999 in 2001. Okay, if the player does the downward, what will be the time for that one? Well, it will be 2001 divided by 100 plus 45. Huh? So this is bigger than 2000 divided by 100. Huh? A little bit, but it's bigger, it's strictly bigger. That means that. Uh, player A, if it changes strategy, it does worse. That means that this is a Nash equilibrium. Every player is doing the best. Okay. And it has to be equal. Okay. There have to be 2,000 going this way and 2,000 that way. Because uh, I just showed you here, if one of them, in this way, the drivers have no incentive to switch. If they switch, they do worse. Okay, no driver has incentive to switch. Also, the balance has to be equal. Okay, if it's not equal, let's say we have 1,500 going the upward route, and we have uh, 2,500 going downward, then that's not a Nash equilibrium. Because if the driver changes, if one of the lower drivers changes to the upward route, they do better. Um, they go from 2,500 over 100 plus 45 to 1,500 divided by 100 plus 45. So if the two numbers are not equal, um, if it's not equal, so if the number in each route is not 2,000, then the routes have uneven travel times. And the driver on the slower route wants to switch. Okay, the driver has incentive to switch. So if the numbers are not equal, it's not a Nash equilibrium. Okay, so the Nash equilibria is exactly where you have 2,000 drivers going on the upward and 2,000 going on the downward. You see that? Huh? It's exactly a game theory thing here. Huh? So the question is, so that's, so that's Nash equilibria. Uh, these are the only Nash equilibria because if it's unbalanced, it's not done. So how many, how many Nash equilibria are there? 
how many can you count them? Is there one, two, three? There's a lot of national equilibria. Any configuration where you have 2,000 here and 2,000 there is a Nash equilibrium. So how many are there? How many? It's a huge number. Huh? It's in fact, if you know, if you remember combinatorics, how many ways can the drivers pick strategies so that you have 2,000 up and 2,000 down? So it's out of 4,000 uh, items, you pick 2,000, which are going up, and then the other 2,000 go down. So the number is a combination of 4,000 taken 2,000 times, if you know this symbol. So that's a huge number, roughly. Huh? It's 4,000 factorial divided by 2,000 factorial squared. Okay, it's a huge number. So this is a funny game, huh? Last time we saw games with only small number of Nash equilibria, one, two, three. This one has huge trillions of Nash, Nash equilibria. Many, many, many more than atoms in the universe in this game. Okay? So you can see that choosing uh, a driving strategy is a game. Okay? That's one thing. Now I show you a second thing. I show you something which is very strange, and it's so strange that it's called paradox. It's called the Bre Bresses paradox. Bresses is the German guy, so you have to pronounce it like German. Huh? Bress, I think, is the way you pronounce the guy's name. So, how do you show that? What is what's happening here? We're going to now make a small change. We're going to add a road. So the government, who is, of course, we know, made out of very smart people, always making the right decisions, okay? They decided to make a very fast highway going from C to D. Okay, let's just make a very simplification. This is very fast. Let's say it's zero time, huh? Simplified, but does not change the, the result. So there's a very fast highway now going from C to D. So we've added a fast road. So the travel time for people should improve, right? Now it's intuitive. You add a fast road to a network, it should make things go faster. Well, no, it doesn't. In this network now, there is now, it's very funny, in the previous one, there was a huge number of Nash equilibria. This one has only one Nash equilibria. Just one. And this one makes it worse for everybody. The time goes worse for everybody. Okay? Okay, so what is the equilibrium? All the drivers are going to take the highway from C to D. Okay? That's the equilibrium, and I will prove to you it's an equilibrium. The time they take is 4,000 divided by 100 plus 0 plus 4,000 divided by 100. So 40 plus 40 plus 0, 80 minutes. Okay? So that is what the time it takes. That's an equilibrium, and the way to show it is the drivers have no incentive to change. If a driver changes, does not take this pass, then the driver will take 85 minutes. So, of course, that's stupid, right? You don't want to go slower. So the drivers will not change. They will all take this. In fact, this, this strategy is a dominant strategy. Remember what that means? It means it's always the best independent of what the others do. Okay, this is the dominant strategy. And there's no incentive to switch. That's pretty bad, right? And compared to the previous case, so we have 80 minutes here. Huh? If we don't have the highway, it's 65 minutes. Huh? Here it's 65. Huh? When we add the highway, it goes from 65 to 80 minutes. 
That's kind of a pain, right? So this is very weird, isn't it? We add a fast probe. So what's going on here? Okay, so we can explain it a little bit. Okay. The fast highway from C to D, uh, this one, uh, this fast highway is actually part of the dominant strategy. So intuitively, it's like a vortex. All the drivers will be sucked in there uh, because it's a dominant strategy. That's the, I mean, intuitively, it's like sucking in all the drivers. But what that means is that it's a dominant strategy, finding this out. And it's better than all the others. Self-interested drivers will not do the balanced solution, okay? Because they will always do better by going this way. So, and a driver does not know how all the other drivers work, go. Every driver is being selfish, you know, driving, okay? There's no way that self-interested behavior by drivers can get back to the even balanced solution, which was better for everybody, yeah? So this is even, you can even see it better than the prisoner's dilemma, huh? You can see that if every driver tries to do the best, the whole thing is worse. Adding resources to a transportation network can hurt performance. And this was first postulated, first understood in 1968. So game theory is a very new thing, yeah? It was invented after World War II. For that, there was no game theory. So this was only found in 1968. And it really exists. And there's famous examples of this. So here's a famous example in Seoul, the capital of South Korea. At some point, there's a, they, this, they removed a huge highway, a six-lane highway, to build a public park. This is called the Cheong Ye Cheong Restoration Project. So they removed a huge highway. And of course, people were saying, oh, no, we have to make it green. And actually, what happened was the travel time into the city improved. So it's a win-win. You have a beautiful park and the travel time improved with the same traffic volume, same number of cars. So you see, this is important. This was a real life thing and it happens in practice. Now this thing happens in real life, okay? In many, many, many places. So let me explain a few and you can find many more by looking at uh, the network. And of course, on the internet, there's many. Yeah? Worsening network behavior by adding routes happens a lot. Or by adding new strategies. Because the problem is, the new strategies might create bad dominant strategies, in fact. Yeah? So electric power grids. You have to understand how electric power grids work. Uh, in Belgium, you have, for example, huge generating stations, and they generate 220 volt, whatever voltage at 50 hertz, okay? If you add links to such a network, you can actually reduce the ability of the network to transmit power by adding links. And the reason is because it's a similar kind of strategy thing, the problem of networks is that you have to have phase, you have a relationship between the phases. So you have this 50 hertz signal, and if you connect two very powerful 50 hertz signals, they have to have some kind of synchronization. Okay? So if you build a new line, it changes that the phase relationships, and so the, 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 the percentage of power going over the different lines changes. Okay? This has an effect through the whole network. Uh, and this can really happen. And now, nowadays, this is very important because we are now transitioning to renewable energy, things like solar power or wind, uh, wind power, uh, so I'm a big fan of wind power. We should have wind power everywhere. But you have a large number of small generators. 
So you have to be careful when you connect up or things can go bad, okay? So this really happens. And it's again a game theory thing. You see, game theories everywhere, huh? if you look. Okay, a second example is biology. This one is endangered species. So you have a bunch of species in an area and they're connected through what's called food webs. So certain species feed on other ones and they give food to other ones or maybe they divide the food in a certain way. So this makes connections, okay? So adding a species is like a move in the game. So the behavior of a species is like a, a strategy. Okay. If you have a doomed species, you know it's going to disappear. You have a endangered species. So if one of them is going, if you remove it, you can actually save other species by doing that. Because they all, all of a sudden they have new food in the right way. So if you carefully study how all the species are connected, then you can improve things by removing certain species. Or else everybody dies, but if you remove one, then all the others will survive, okay? So I'm not gonna show you the detail, but again, this is the same principle, game theory, okay? Sports teams, this is an interesting one, okay? If you look at basketball, basketball team, uh, the, the players pass the ball to each other and they try to make a basket and to score, but there is a network of possibilities to store, score basket. Some players are fast runners, some players are fast, are good shooters, some players are good in, in uh, certain kinds of movements. So each path to score a bas basket has, a, has an efficiency. Now if you add one very good player, a champion, you add that player to the team, this could make the team play worse. It's pretty weird, huh? You add this excellent player and then it goes worse. And this actually also happens in soccer. So this actually happens, and there's this coach called Helenio Herrera says, with 10 players, our team plays better than with 11. That's possible. He's not, the guy is not crazy out there. It's very possible. Okay, so this is, can be explained through game theory, this paradox. So it's not really a paradox, it's actually logical. So a paradox is a situation that seems contradictory, but it's actually reasonable. Okay, so there's no problem with this, there's no contradiction. Adding a new strategy makes things, can make things worse for everybody. We already saw this prisoner's dilemma. So the prisoner's dilemma, the prisoner can confess or not confess. Now, if they were not able to do not confess, if they were always confessing, then it would be better. But adding the possibility of not confess uh, makes things worse. Okay? So adding a strategy can make things worse. So adding strategies is not necessarily a good thing. Sometimes removing strategies is the right thing, okay? And you can actually do some computation on this for traffic. So assume that the travel time on a, on a road is a linear function of the number of cars. So that's a simplification, huh? It's usually nonlinear. But assume that, that when the number of cars increases, the time goes up. If you have that, then it's some linear function. And then you can prove, if you have a network with, with equilibrium, and you add edges, then the new network can be worse. It, but there's a limit. It can be up to four thirds worse. So it can be infinitely worse. That's already nice. But it can be one third, 30% worse. Okay. So this is a theoretical result that's proved for linear functions. If it's nonlinear, it can be much, much worse. So nonlinear means, for example, that the, the time goes 
up linear, but at a certain number of cars, it goes very strongly up. But it's not linear anymore. And if that happens, it can be much, much worse. But even with linears, you can actually prove things. So it's, you can actually kind of quantify how much worse it gets. Okay? So that's uh, an application of game theory to cars. So you see, Nash equilibrium is very important there. And, and sometimes you have dominant strategies, or even and or Nash equilibria leading to worse results. Well, we already saw that in, in other kinds of games, but it happens in real traffic. Okay, so that's one thing. Let me then show now another kind of application. This all, by the way, sorry, I've not mentioned it. This can also be applied to routing on the internet, huh? of course, huh? So routers, packets, traveling. Uh, if you add a, a, a link on the internet, the bandwidth of the internet can get worse, of course. Huh? That's a very similar situation. So how you program the routers is important too. So I don't show an internet application here, but that's also application of this. Okay. So that's uh, car traffic. Now let me show you another application, which is auctions. This is a little bit more complicated thing, uh, the vente aux enchères. So I'll give you some history of auctions. You can find a lot of auctions are famous things. Huh? If you ever see James Bond movies, you see a lot of auctions. Huh? You know, they sell Fabergé eggs and uh, some Russian general is trying to get money for taking over the world, whatever. But uh, so auctions have a long history. Uh, so in ancient Babylon, uh, women were auctioned off for marriage. That's pretty sexist, isn't it? Uh, in ancient Rome, not just slaves, but every kind of spoils of a battle or whatever was sold off. Auctions are very old things. Okay. Modern times, ships, artworks, tulip bulbs. There's a very famous uh, what is it? Economic bubble that happened in the Netherlands in that time when tulip, a small tulip bulb, could be worth enormous. So the price went through the roof. Okay. Uh, of course, you know the auction houses, Christie's, Sotheby's. Also, other things like frequency spectrum bands. If we're doing Wi-Fi and I want to make some kind of a company selling Wi-Fi. I need to use radio spectrum, but radio spectrum is regulated, so I'm not allowed to use it without getting rights to it. And the rights are sold by the government, and it's sold by in auctions. Okay? And of course, the government gets a lot of money out of that. And today, on the internet, <coughs> auctions are very, very much used. Everyone uses them, even without knowing it. Okay? And it's even much, much more flexible than previously, because we're breaking down the physical limitations. You don't have to be in the same place, or uh, the size of the audience doesn't have to be small. You can have millions of people in an auction, okay? And this was in 2002, online auctions accounted for 30% of e-commerce. This is a long time ago. Today, I'm not sure how much it is. It's probably a higher percentage. <clears throat> now, you might think the online, the largest online auction is eBay. So maybe you did already auctions on eBay. So I've done auctions. And has anyone done, who has done an auction on eBay? A few people, OK. I mean, you can buy things without auction, but you can also do auction. So I do that sometimes. But that's not really where most of the money is. Most of the money in auctions is in search engines. When you search for something in Google, usually you have paid links. And Google gets money for those. Okay? And that's how Google became a huge, super rich company, because they were the first ones to do that. So it's money just flowing into Google. Okay? 
huge, they make a huge amount of money through that. And uh, so how do they determine the price? How much does a, one of those paid links cost? Who knows? It's hard to. So Google does not set a price for that, but they auction them off. So the, one, the companies who want to buy them, they have some idea of how much it's worth for them. Okay? So there's an auction. And all those auctions are invisible. Even when you see ads, you go to a newspaper site or whatever, any site on the internet, and you see an ad there. How is it determined? How is it chosen? Well, there's an auction, okay? So there's hundreds of auctions going on every time you look at a website. So that's huge. So auctions are important, huh? Okay, so today we we'll learn about auctions. Okay, there's many different kinds of auctions. And auctions are kind of complicated, so I will try to explain it in a nice, clear way. We have one seller auctioning one thing to a set of buyers. Okay, so I'm selling the book on eBay and I'm auctioning the book. Okay, or I'm selling a uh, a mechano set from the 1930s on eBay, now auctioning. So that's the, what we're going to look at, one seller and many buyers. There's also the opposite auction, also exists, huh? where you have one buyer and many sellers. This is called procurement auction. Uh, so government does this very often. I want to make a building, and I ask for different construction companies, how much does it cost? So they're all bidding on making the one, the building, okay? So there it's the, the, the sellers who are many, and there's one buyer. So that's the opposite kind of auction. Huh? And so I'm not gonna talk about it, but it's, it's basically, the, it's very similar, except it's the buyers are placed by sellers. Huh? But I'll talk just about the regular kind of auction, okay? Okay, so we'll talk about regular auctions. Now, we have to model them. We have to assume some things. And the main, the most important assumption is that each bidder, so each person who wants to buy, knows the value of the thing they want to buy. If I buy a book on eBay and I see that book being auctioned, I say, for me, that book is worth 25 euros, but no more. It's worth 25, okay? So every bidder knows the value or has that the thing has for them. Of course, different bidders can have different values. Huh? This is called the bidder's true value. So we assume that. That the bidder knows what the thing is worth for them. And the bidder is willing to pay any price up to the true value, but no higher. Because if they pay more, they lose. Okay? If my true value is 25, and, uh, and I bid 30, and I win, then I'm losing 5 euros. Okay? So we assume the bidders do not want to lose money, and that they have a true value. So this is the whole theory is based on this, okay? So that's the basic assumption. So any kind of a, a number, the bidder always has a true value, okay? Okay, so that's one thing. Now, there's, let me explain the different kinds of auctions. There are actually four main kinds of auctions, historically. You can see the different ones, and they have different names. Uh, the one that you see most often, uh, the one that you see in James Bond movies, is the ascending bid auction. This one is also called English auction. It's interactive, and it happens in real time. So you have all the people sitting in a room. You have the guy who's the auction manager, uh, or seller, and the price is raised so that you set a price and you have a bid, okay? And then somebody bids more. 
So the price goes up until everyone drops out, okay? Until there's only one bidder left and that bidder gets the thing, okay? So the price keeps going up until there's only one bidder left. This is called the sending bid option. But there's also a funny one called descending bid option. These one, this is called Dutch auction. It's also interactive. And this goes exactly the opposite. So the seller sets a very, very high price. And nobody wants to buy. And the seller lowers a little bit the price. Nobody wants to buy. It keeps lowering until somebody wants to buy. So the seller gradually lowers until somebody accepts. And then that one buys, and the others they don't get. It. Okay? So these are the two main ones for real time. But there's two other ones that are also used. This is when people can't get in a room. It's called first price sealed bid and second price sealed bid. These might seem very weird, but actually we're going to see they're the same as those. We'll see that. So in fact, there's only two. There's really only two different kinds. So we'll see that these two are actually the same. But let me explain. Sealed bid means all the, the bidders write the price in an envelope, close the envelope. They send the envelope to the seller. The seller opens all the envelopes. And uh, the highest bidder wins. It's very simple, huh? So each of you writes a number on an envelope. You give it to me. I open all of them. And, I, and the one with the highest number wins. So this is simultaneous. There's no real time up huh? here. It's like one move in the game, kind of. Huh? Whereas this one is where we have many, in both of these two, it's interactive and things are changing over time. Huh? But in this one, it's no change, simultaneous. So the highest bidder wins, and he pays the value of the bid. It's reasonable, right? But there's a really funny variation of this called second price sealed bid auction. This one is also called Vickery auction because there was a guy named Vickery who was really important to analyze auctions. And this guy won a Nobel Prize of economics in 1996. So you see, this area is a good place for getting Nobel Prizes. Huh? Nash won a Nobel Prize, Vickery wins another Nobel Prize. Okay, so how does this work? It looks very similar. Everybody writes the number on the envelope. You seal the envelope. I mean, you write your name on it, of course. You give it to me. I open the envelopes. The highest bidder wins, as before. But the highest bidder pays the value of the second highest bid. That's kind of weird, huh? The highest bidder does not pay the number that he wrote down. He pays the number of the second guy. Okay. That seems very weird, but actually this one, we will see, the second price is actually kind of the best one, and we will see that the ascending bid one, the one you see in James Bond movies, is actually the same as this one, if you think about it. So I'll explain that. So the second price sealed bid auction which might seem to be a very weird one, is actually very natural, you will see, and is actually, in some sense, it's the best. Okay, so we'll see that. But first, now we're going to, we're going to do some analysis of these, huh? Okay, but before analyzing the auctions, uh, I want to uh, explain when is it good to do auctions? Okay, let's take a step back. When do we want to sell things? By auctions. Because auctions is kind of overhead, huh? And people bidding. And when do you do it? When I go to the supermarket, I'm not auctioning. I look at the bag of oranges, and it says two and a half euro, and I buy it. Okay? There's no auction. Okay? So you don't always use auctions. So when do you use auctions? That's important to know. When is auctions the right way? And in fact, it's used when nobody knows the buyer's true values. 
They're unknown. I mean, the buyer knows their value, but nobody else knows. So if the supermarket does not know what, the, what I consider to be the value of oranges, then they would make an auction, because that's a way for them to find out. Okay. So if the buyer's true values are unknown to others, so the seller does not know, and the other buyers do not know. So each buyer has its own private secret value. The oranges are worth so much. It doesn't work for oranges, right? because everybody knows that oranges are low value things. Huh? An orange is like, uh, a kilo of oranges is like two euros, okay? And everybody knows that, so there's no secret for oranges. But for other things, there might be secrets. It might be difficult to know. If I'm selling a jewel, a jewel, well, a diamond, or a Fabergé egg, these are famous jewels made by uh, a famous jeweler named Fabergé for the Russian czars. And somehow the Russian Soviet government inherited many of those eggs. They were given as Easter presents for, for the, from the czar to his wife or whatever. Okay, But how much is that worth, one of those eggs? I mean, sure, it has jewelry, it has gold, but it's not the value of the gold. Nobody knows, what is that worth? So the true value is unknown. But if I want to buy one, I know how much it's worth to me, okay? I say, I, I will pay 20, 250,000 euros for a Fabergé egg, okay? I wish I had so much money to pay for a Fabergé egg, okay? So every buyer knows the value. And on the internet, it's very common. The search that I mentioned, uh, the source of Google's power is this. This is where Google got its, it's a money machine for Google. But how much is a paid link worth? Okay, if I type in Google uh, something like uh, uh, a disease, tuberculosis, for example. And I get some links because I want to know about tuberculosis. Then there's a paid link. Maybe it's a link to a doctor who can diagnose or cure or do medication or whatever. How much is that worth? I don't know. Who knows? But the person who needs the education, they know how much it's worth for them. So the buyer knows, each buyer knows what it's worth for them. Okay. So the buyer is the only one who knows the value. Nobody else knows. So in search advertising, this is typical. So that's why you use auctions. It's when nobody knows the buyer values. Uh, if the values are known, then auctions are unnecessary. So here let me explain. Let me show you a little bit of economics the case when the values are known. Okay, I'm selling something. I'm a seller, and I have a Fabergé egg, and for me this egg is worth 200,000 euros. Okay, well, at least. And, I'm, and there's a buyer who wants to buy the Fabergé eggs, and he is willing to pay 250,000. Okay, so the seller has a minimum sell price. Okay, they will not sell lower than that, so it's worth that much for them. The buyer has a maximum buy price. If it's more expensive, they will not buy, because it's worthwhile for them. Okay, so there's a, a, a space between, which is called the surplus, generated by the sale. So this is like the profit. If I'm buying a Fabergé egg for 250000 and the seller is thinking it's only worth 200,000, then the seller has gained 50,000, okay? Okay? But if the buyer only pays, uh, if the buyer, so, so the seller thinks it's 200,000, so the, if the seller sells it at just a little bit less than Y, then the full surplus goes to the seller, okay? But if the buyer could somehow buy it at a lower price, 
maybe the buyer will buy it, maybe the seller really, really, really needs to get rid of this Fabergé egg very fast. You cannot keep it. So for some reason, the seller is in a hurry. And the buyer says, you have this Fabergé egg, I will pay you 200,000 euros plus 25 cents. Seller says, shit, I want to earn more, but the police is knocking on my door. Yes, take it. So in that case, the surplus goes to the buyer. Because the buyer thinks it's worth 250,000, but he only paid 200,000 for it. So the buyer has gained 50,000, okay? So this surplus, y minus x, is divided by the buyer and the seller, depending on the situation. So this is what happens when the values are known. Because both the buyer and the seller, they know this, okay? They know this, so everybody knows. But if the, buyer, if, the value, if the buyer's value is unknown, the seller has no idea how much the buyer is going to pay. They're not going to do like this. They're going to, the seller is going to make an auction, okay, in that case. So when the values are unknown, that's when auctions are done. So this is the condition. The buyer's true <coughs> values are only known to themselves. Okay? Okay, let's talk a little bit about unknown values now. There's actually two kinds of unknown values, and it leads to different options, different strategies. Okay? Uh, maybe each buyer has its own value, and it's for them. Some people really love Fabergé eggs, and it's huge value. Other people, yeah, it's okay, but I mean, I, I prefer diamonds, but if there's no diamonds, I will take Fabergé eggs, okay? So each buyer can have an independent private value, and each, because each buyer is interested in the item for personal use, okay? So, for example, um, here's a used car, a used car, a yard car from the 1930s. If I really, really love these used cars and I have a lot of money, then that car is worth a lot for me. But if I don't have so much money, the car is worth less. Okay? The buyers have different tastes. Each buyer has its own, has their own way of doing it. So these are private unknown. But there's another kind of unknown where it's the same unknown for all the buyers. I mean, it's still values unknown, but it's the same because the buyers want to resell. So the buyer is an antique shop, okay? The buyer will buy an antique, but will sell it in their shop. Uh, and so the antique has a value depending on what the person who will buy it will be the other, someone else. Or the buyer is an oil company, and they buy oil fields, and the value of the oil field is how much oil is underground, okay? But that amount of oil is like a constant for everybody. So the value has an unknown value, but it's the same for all the buyers. Okay? Still unknown, but all the buyers have the same. So these are two different ways of looking, and it leads to different strategies. So I will mostly talk about private values, but I also talk a little bit about common values. Common values is interesting because you have this very phenomenon called winner's curse where the winner is actually losing. So common value, I'll talk about it near the end. So right now, I'll talk mostly about private values. Every buyer has their own value, and buyers can have different values, okay? For example, they want to buy medicine, uh, and depending on how serious the disease is they have, they pay more or less. Or they want to buy wine, and they have different tastes in wine, the different buyers. So the, the 1959 Don Rothschild is worth 100 euro for this guy, but only 50 euro for the other guy, okay? So we assume now that every buyer has an independent value that's known only for them, okay? So that's the, when you do an auction. And now I'm going to take the four auctions. So we saw these four. Uh, 
And I'll turn, show you there's actually only two different ones. Uh, so the four, two of them, you can actually match them. Uh, the ascending bid auction, this is what I would call the James Bond one, is the same as a second price. And the descending bid auction is the same as a first price. And you can, if you think about it, you can understand why. For example, in the descending bid, the price starts very high and then goes down, okay? Keeps going down until one buyer gets it. So during the auction, the buyers learn nothing. Nothing happens until the first buyer gets it. And each bidder has their bid and the highest one gets it, and that's it. You don't know anything else. This is exactly the same as a sealed bid first price. If you write down the prices on an envelope, give it to me, and I open the envelopes, and I, the one with the highest gets it. That's exactly the same. Here also, it's the one with the highest gets it, and nobody learns anything else. Okay? The item goes to the bidder with the highest value, and the bidder pays that value. That's it. Okay? So the descending bid is equivalent to first price sealed bid. Okay? Now the ascending bid, this one is, is it's funny, you think you understand this, huh? But I will explain. This one is actually the same as a second price auction. How is that? How does that work? Okay, now here, let's think about it. So think of an ascending bid auction. So the price is going up. And for each price level, you have some bidders. And then one of the bidders increases, the other one increases. So you keep increasing until there's only one bidder left. Okay? Okay, so you should keep in until the price reaches your true value and then drop out. Okay, because if the price goes higher than the true value, then you might lose money. Okay, the only way you guarantee not losing is you can stay in. So if I'm buying Fabergé egg and I consider it 250,000 and it's, they're selling it 50,000, 60, 100, 120, 200, 250, 260, ah, shit. So I don't buy it because it's above my, my limit, okay? My true value. And the person with the highest bid is the one who stays in the lot, of course. Huh? But what do they pay? What are they paying? So let's say my highest bid is 250,000. And then the bid goes up to 260,000. Too much for me, I'm out. So the, the person who bid 260000 gets the A. But what is their true value? We don't actually know. Maybe their true value is 500000 But they don't have to pay 500000 They only have to pay 260000 In fact, the winner is actually paying the price of the second highest. Think about it. Uh, the winner, one who gets the A, is actually paying just a little bit more than where the second guy dropped out. Uh, so this is very small normally, it's small increment. So they're essentially paying the, the true, the value of the second highest. So the ascending bid is the same, it has the same behavior as the second price. You see that? You see why it's the second? Because the one who wins, we never actually see how far he's willing to go. Huh? Maybe he considers the egg is worth a million for him. When he gets a bargain, he only has to pay 260000 He's only paying the value of the second highest bidder. So the ascending bid auction uh, is actually a second price auction. And so the ascending bid auction is very similar to the sealed bid second price. It's not exactly the same, okay? Because the ascending bid is actually real time. 
of this event is happening in real time, and we see people dropping out. So we actually learn about the other buyers. That we see things happen in real time. And in the sealed bid, we only know the winner and what they pay, which is the second. Okay? So it's not exactly equivalent, but it has exactly the same behavior for the winner. So we say it's a simulation. Of, so we're only actually, it's giving the same winner and the same price. So it's very similar, okay? It's not exactly equivalent because this one is real time, huh? The sending bid is real time thing. Whereas in the first one, it's also real time, but nothing happens until the guy bids. So it's actually exactly equivalent to first press. Where here, it's only equivalent for the winner. Okay? So, but still pretty close. So you can still kind of say it's equivalent. Okay? So this one is the most important one. The second price auction is really the most important one. Okay? And we will see that. But I will now first make a small break. My favorite. Petit pause. Then we learn about second price. But it's also used a lot because of the reason that I will explain. Um, so the sealed bid second price option, which is basically the same as the ascending bid option, is widely used, of course. And the eBay auction format is a second price auction. You know how the eBay auction works? Let's say, for example, I want to buy a book, and it's on auction, and the current auction value is 10 euro. I want to buy this book, and, okay? And its current value in the auction is 10 euro. That somebody else has bid 10 euro. I want to buy it, but for me, the book has a value of 25. So I tell eBay, that the book has a value of 25. So eBay, what is it going to do? It's not going to make 25 here. Right? It's going to put the book, it's going to raise a little bit, the bid, and it's going to say that it's me. But of course, it, it's private. Nobody knows that. It's going to raise it a little bit. And then the other person who had 10 maybe wants to go higher, okay? Maybe the other person's maximum is 15, okay? So then the other person, let's say, goes up 12, but my maximum is 25. So it keeps going higher, and eventually it reaches 16. And then this person drops out, okay? But it's, for me, I don't drop out, because my maximum is 25. So I win. I win, I buy the book, but I only paid 16 euros. You see that? So e, I think eBay, the increment is one euro. It can be very small. But essentially, I'm paying the, the maximum of the second person. You see? So eBay is a second price option. You see why? Right? It's part of how it works. So all of the ascending bid options are second price auctions. Now also the sponsored search markets used by Google, which I'll explain a little bit more in a while, search engines, they also use a kind of second price. It's more complicated because you have lots of different keywords and different companies and the companies are interested in different keywords. So it's a little bit more complicated, but basically it, they generalize second price. So it's the same idea as second Okay. And so why is second price so important? Because bidding is very easy in the second price. We'll see in other ones, like the first price, it's much harder to figure out what you should bid in to not lose money. In a second price auction, you bid is your true value. So my true value for the book is 25. That's it. I don't have to make complicated thinking, okay? Bidding your true value is a dominant strategy in the second price sealed bid auction. 
Uh, the true value, of course, that doesn't mean you pay that much. Huh? That's the maximum you pay, because you will pay what the second person did, of course. Huh? This would be the maximum. Huh? Okay, so it doesn't mean you're going to pay that amount. But bidding, that means that's the maximum you're willing to pay. That is dominant strategy. That means it's the best, no matter what the others do. Remember what it means, a dominant strategy? That means no matter what strategies are chosen by all the other bidders, your best strategy is always bidding your true value. That's a very strong result, actually. Yeah? This is a theorem in auction theory. Okay? The best choice of bid is exactly what the object is worth to you. That makes bidding very easy. That makes eBay bidding very easy. Okay? And you know you're not going to lose money, for sure. So it makes it very easy to do auctions. We're going to prove this result in just a few minutes. But first, I want to talk about why, how Google is making money. Okay? Web search engines in the olden days, so I'll give you some history. Yeah? So the web started around 1990. And in those days, the search engines were very primitive. There was a search engine called AltaVista. I used it in 1990, OK? Uh, but there was a small company called Google. They had actually a very smart search engine doing a very smart algorithm called PageRank, which we'll see later in the course. And they had, in those days, they had this little button called saying, are you, I'm feeling lucky. You click on that, you only get one result, which is the top result. And Google was saying, this is, you will be almost surely, you'll be happy. So they were very, uh, so they had this very smart algorithm. So eventually they took over, and all the other ones fell away. And Google eventually figured out how to make money out of this. Because the very, very beginning, they were not making money, and they wanted to make a search engine. They did keyword-based advertising. This is the main source of money flowing into Google. This is how Google became multi-billion, trillion, whatever. Because all, every time you look at a web page, money is going to Google, okay? Uh, you do a search I mean, money is going to Google. And now, of course, it's also used for advertising in general. And the way it works is it's called pay-per-click. You see a link from an advertisement. Okay? So you see, I want to buy a car, and you see uh, advertisement for Rolls-Royce, or whatever, okay, Porsche, uh, cars, or uh, De Chevaux, or something, yeah? depending on how much they think, how much money they think you have. But the advertiser pays nothing until you click on it. So this is very nice for the advertiser, very, because when you click on it, that means you're interested in it. Okay? So the advertiser is willing to pay money for people clicking on it, pay-per-click. And some examples, okay? So there's a company called Cuba Lake. I have no idea what they do. Uh, if you want to look at this link, you will get the link for that company. Uh, but they will, you will go to that company's website, so they're very happy if you go to their website. And the cost for click is one and a half dollars. It's a lot. Huh? These clicks are worth, I mean, the advertisers pay a lot of money. Yeah? Uh, calligraphy pens. Uh, this was in 2010, but nowadays probably even more. Uh, it costs one dollar seventy per click. That's a lot. For just one click, yeah? But it's to a company selling calligraphy pens. Even typos, calligraphy pens, uh, maybe you, uh, that also is worth a lot. So even the typos get, uh, get it done, huh? get you type calligraphy pens, and you will also get ads for calligraphy pens, and it's a little bit cheaper to the advertiser. Some queries are very expensive. 
loan consolidation, mortgage refinancing. Why do I type mortgage refinancing? Uh, uh, mortgage is, um, is the loan when you buy a house, okay? That you buy, non prend pour acheter une maison. If you cannot pay the monthly payment, you have to refinance. Well, how do you do it? Well, you type mortgage refinance in Google and, and you find a company that will help you. Well, those, those companies, those clicks, they have to pay $50 or more. So each time somebody clicks on one of those, the advertiser has to pay $50 to Google. Or this one, mes mesothelioma. This is a very funny disease. Almost nobody knows what it is. So nobody will type this in Google. But someone who types this in Google is probably someone who suffers from this. And this is actually exposure to asbestos in the workplace. So if I'm exposed to asbestos in the worst place, so this is of course written by Americans. My first, my first idea is not to go to a doctor. My first idea is to sue my employer, is to make a lawsuit to get huge amount of money and go to the doctor after. Okay. So if I the 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 the, 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 the clicks the, here go to law firms, is uh, that who will help you? to make a lawsuit against your employer. Of course, they're very expensive, these clicks, huh? Okay? So the question is, how, how do we know these prices? $50, $0.60, $1.70. How are the prices set? How does Google know that that click is worth $50? Well, they don't know, okay? Uh, the only people who know are the buyers. The buyers are the people who click. If I am suffering from mesothelioma and I'm feeling bad, I know what it's worth for me, okay? But nobody else knows. So this is the case of unknown private values. The only one who knows is the buyer, okay? So you have to do auction. Of course, it's hard because there's multiple slots. Uh, there's the first, second, third, fourth. It also depends on the keywords, and each slot has many advertisers, advertisements, advertisers who might have different priorities. So it's a big, complicated auction. Okay, but the technique is called generalized second price auction. The idea is they use a principle which is called VCG principle, which means Vickery Clark Groves principle, or the three researchers who figured it out. Basically, it's a way of generalizing second price so it works in very complicated cases. Okay? Uh, and truthful bidding, which is bidding your value, this is called truthful bidding is a dominant strategy, just like for second price. Huh? Just like for the pure second price. It makes bidding easy. It encourages truthful bidding. So this makes the auction with simple. And the principle is the following. It's a funny principle. Each individual is charged a price equal to the harm he causes the other bidders by receiving the item. So this actually is generalizing second price. So we can see the example. So here's an example. Let's say uh, bidder one is not there. So bidder one would be the winner. But if bidder one were not present, then bidder two gets the item and has a value of V2. Okay. But bidder one is there, so bidder two does not win. Okay. So we're assuming the bidder one is winning, but that because of bidder one, bidder two is not winning. So bidder one kind of takes the item away from bidder two. But bidder two values the item at V2. Uh, but if bidder two does not get the item, bidder two is kind of 
losing V2 in some sense. So I see the, how the economists think. Bitter 2 is not getting this item that is worth V2 because of bitter 1. So in some sense, because of bitter 1, bitter 2 is losing V2. Okay? And V2 is exactly what bitter 1 pays, of course. It's the value of the second oh, guy. And only bitter 1 and 2 are important here. Right? The other bitters, 3 through N, are unaffected, since they're always they're losing. Huh? Uh, bitter 2 would win if bitter 1 was not there. So bitter 1 is the highest. Bitter, bitter 2 is the second one. Huh? So this is kind of a way of generalizing second price, okay? So that it works in more general rules. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say right now for sponsored search. Now I want to prove something. I want to talk about second price as a game. Now we're going to start doing game theory again on second price. This is a little bit subtle. So the bidders are the players. So I'm going to also show a little bit on the board. Huh? It's not going to be only on the slide. I'm going to show some of it on the board to help you understand. So the bidders are the players. And the strategy is how much I hit. Okay? So player, the player is the bidder. Bidder I is player I. And the strategy is the move. Huh? Is the amount bid, is the amount of the bid. Yeah, so bidder, bidder I does P sub I. Okay? And of course, bidder I has the true value, which is the secret known inside his head, of VI, yeah? So VI is what the bidder thinks in his head is the value for him or for her, but BI is what the bidder will actually bid. Okay? Okay, clear. So what is the payoff now? So the payoff. Okay? So let's say BI wins. So if BI wins, so if I wins, huh? then what is the payoff? The payoff is how much I is gaining. So if I wins, I gets the item, which is worth VI huh? for I. Huh? That's how much it's worth for me. I get the item, but I, how much does I pay? I pays the second price. So assume the second uh, price is another bid, BJ, which is BJ. So J is the second price. So the payoff is what I get minus what I pay. Uh, so this is the value for BI. This is what BI pays. Uh, which is the second price. Okay? So the payoff for the winner is VI minus BJ. It is what I get minus the pay. Okay? That's not so complicated, though. You have to be careful. Here I have my true value, and here I have the bid for J, which is the second bid. Okay? So let me think about that. Now, I'm, we also have to worry about ties. If two people submit exactly the same bid, let me ignore that for now. We just want to know, we can just see this. Okay? Okay. Now, let's see how this theorem works. So I said the best bid, so the best BI is what the object is worth to me. Okay? So here's the theorem. Second price auction theorem. In a sealed bid second price auction, it is a dominant strategy for each bidder I to choose a bid BI equal VI. 
So the bid BI will be equal to my true value. Okay? So we have, we're going to prove that. Okay? So we want to prove that. So to prove that, we have to show that if, if the bidder bids this, then if I have any other value, then VI will cause the payoff to reduce, or at least not to increase. Huh? No deviation will improve the payoff. Okay? We have to show that if VI is something else, then the payoff will not be higher. Okay? So let me explain how we show that. So let me get a picture. First let me say what is the payoff, just for your memory. Payoff. The payoff for I is V I minus B J. It's my true value. Minus what I pay, what I have to pay. Uh -huh. So the difference between those two is like the profit, is what I'm getting now, the extra. So assume, assume, VI is equal to VI. So my bid is equal to my true value. How do we show this is a dominant strategy? Well, we have to show that if it's higher, then the payoff will get worse, or it, at least will not get better. Right? Maybe it stays the same, but it will not get better if I raise the bid or if I lower the bid. Okay, how to prove? So there's two cases. Either VI will be bigger than VI, and VI is less than VI. We have to show payoff does not increase. Okay, and here the same. Payoff does not increase. Okay. So we have to do some delicate reasoning for this. But in fact, we know enough for this. Huh? One very important thing, okay, the amount paid by the winner is determined entirely by the other bids. So, uh, BI is actually not determining the payoff. What I pay is determined by the somebody else, okay, okay. So when I change my bid, all other bids stay the same. Okay? So if I change my bid, BI, BI changes, all other BJs are the same. Okay? The payoff will only change if this changes. The payoff will only change if this number changes. So it will only change if, if, this, if this one basically changes. So how can this change? Well, or if I don't win. Huh? So this is if I win. Huh? This is if I win. Huh? The payoff is zero if I lose. Huh? In fact, huh? So the only way the payoff can change is if either I win, I lost before and I win now, or I win now and I, I, I lose after. Okay, so that, that's a theoretical thing. Let me now show you the reasoning. This, this diagram shows it, but I want to explain it on the board so that you can follow it, okay? So let me explain it here. I want to explain to you the, the intuition. So this axis is the axis of my bid. Huh? Huh? So bid B I. Okay? 
So higher, lower. Okay, here I have bi is equal to vi. This is the truth rule. Huh? So in this axis, so bi will increase when I go up. Okay, and bi will decrease when I go lower. Lower. And this is the point when bi is equal to vi. Okay. So I'm assuming I have this. Now, I have two possibilities. I increase uh, bi, so I have bi prime bigger than bi, or I have decreased. There's two ways to do it, though. Let me call them bi double prime. So I have to look at these two cases separately. So what happens if I increase my bit? So I have a new bit. Bi prime. Okay. Good. So what happens to my payoff? What happens to payoff when I do this? Okay. So I'm increasing the bit. So the only way for my payoff to change is if I lost here and I win here. So it's the same, same, unless I lose with the i and win with the i prime. Okay. The only way the payoff will change is if my loss win changes, because otherwise the payoff is the same. If I if I if I win and I stay winner. The payoff has not changed. And if I lose and I stay loser, the payoff will be zero in both cases. So the only way for the payoff to change when I increase the bid is that if I have lost here and I win here, it can't be the other way. Huh? There's no way I can lose by increasing the bid, huh? but I might win. So the only way the payoff of it changes is that, that, that this was a loss. And this was a win. Okay? Okay. That means if this one is a win and this one is a loss, that means the second place guy has to be in here somewhere. The second place guy. Okay? We call it BK. Second place guy. Huh? The only way that, I mean, if I lose here, that means this guy was higher than me because I'm losing. But if I'm winning here, then this guy has to be less than me. So if I go from lose to win, then the second place guy has to be somewhere in there, huh? in the middle. Because at this, if my bi is bi, then this is the winner. But if my bi is this one, then this is the, this is a loser. So how does the payoff change now for this? So I'm winning here. I'm winning. Great. So what is my payoff? My payoff is this. Vi minus Vj. Okay. My payoff. What is my payoff? Huh? So here my payoff was zero because I lost. But here my payoff is Vi minus Vk. Okay. Unfortunately, VI is less than BK. Oof, this is so my payoff is not getting better, huh? Might get worse. Uh, it's this difference. It might actually be less than zero. So I lose. It's not good, huh? So increasing beyond VI will if I it goes from lose to win, I actually lose money. So that's not good, okay? So I shouldn't decrease. But what happens if I decrease? What happens if I decrease my bid to some other value? GI double prime. Okay? This is my new bid, which is less than BI. Okay? 
And the only way the payoff will change, again, is if I change my loss with. So the, this, the only way, when I, if I reduce, the only way changes if I change loss win. If I win, if I lose in both of these, then my payoff will be zero in both. So nothing changes. If I win in both, my payoff will be VI minus VJ, so it doesn't change either. Okay? So the only way my payoff will change is if I win in one of them and I lose in the other. But when I reduce my bid, I can only lose, huh? I never win. So that means it has to be a win here and a lose here. So it's basically a win for VI and a lose for VI double prime. And the, the second guy has to be somewhere here. Huh? Second place guy. Let me uh, Give this guy another name. Uh, I call it BK here. Uh, let me call it BL or something. Uh, so if this one loses, that means somebody else has to be higher than me, but BI wins. That means the second has to be lower. So the second guy has to be somewhere in there in that interval. Okay? So the payoff when I won was VI minus BL, uh, my true value minus what I paid. So I pay the second price guy. Yeah? So if I win, my payoff is this. If I lose, my payoff is zero. Right? But VI minus BL is greater than zero. Technically greater than equal, right? but usually it will be greater than zero. Okay. That means I start from winning and then I lose. That means I lose this amount. This goes to zero. Oh, that means my payoff goes down again. Huh? So in fact, in both cases, my payoff is going down. It's kind of a pain. Huh? So the best place for me is here, is to be VI VI. If I go down huh, and the payoff changes, then I go from a win to a lose, and then my payoff goes down. If I go up, I go from a lose to a win, but again my payoff goes down. It's because the payoff is, there's this VI in there. Huh? The payoff here, it's a very logical number out huh, here. What do I gain if I'm paying the second amount? I gain my true value minus what I pay. It's not arbitrary that I put VI here, huh? This is really what I'm gaining, huh? Okay. But following the reasoning, you can see that if we do anything else than pick VI, we're going to lose. Okay. That means that uh, the best bid is to bid your true value. Okay. That's the second price theorem. So I recommend you you go you follow this reasoning carefully. Huh? It's not a complicated reasoning, but you have to have your ideas clear in your head. The, the main idea is what does this mean? What does this payoff mean? You have to understand it to understand the proof. Okay. Okay. So that tells us that second price is. Very good. Huh? The best bid is, is the your value. Okay, so this so second price is very good. And sponsor search the second price. But let me talk also about first price. And we'll see. I'm not going to prove any more theorems. Okay. Uh, first price is harder, in fact. And if you want to do analysis, it gets very complicated. And I'm not going to do. But let me explain also first price. You can see the difference. Okay, so a first price option is actually very different from the second price. Okay, and here's the great, the main difference is here. In a second price auction, the value of your bid determines whether you win. 
but it does not determine how much you pay. Okay? If you win, it's because you have a high bid, but you're only paying the second. So the value of your bid only determines whether you're win or lose, but not how much you have to pay. But in a first price auction, the value of your bid determines whether you're win or lose, but also how much you pay, because you pay the first price, the bid. Uh, so that actually makes the second price a much better way. How much you pay does not depend on what you bid, okay? Because it's the second guy. So what you bid can be an enormous, very high number. Doesn't matter. That's not how much you pay. But in the first price auction, you have to be very careful because if you win, that's what you have to pay. If I bid a million and I win, I have to pay a million. Oof. But in second price, you don't. You pay the second guy, okay? So we can look at the first price auction again, this game theory. So bidders are players. The bidder strategy is again the amount to bid. And it's also a function of the true value. So again, we're going to assume that every bidder has this true value. Okay, so how much do you, what's your payoff? if you win. But if you win, then your payoff is the value of what you get, which is VI, you're getting the Fabergé egg, it's worth this, minus how much you pay. So it's VI minus BI. It's not VI minus BJ, yeah? It's how much you think it's worth minus how much you bid, not how much the second guy. So you have to be very careful on what you bid here. See, that's crucial, huh? So there's an intuition. In the second bid price, you don't have to worry so much because your payoff, the bid is not in there. But in the first price, the, your bid is in there, in the payoff. So you have to worry about what you pay, okay? What, what you're actually, huh? So how do you bid? Well, bidding your true value is not dominant anymore. First price is actually more complicated. If you lose, you get zero. But if you win, if your bid is equal to VI, you would also get zero. So bidding your true value is not good here. Huh? Huh? If it's VI minus BI, and if I bid my true value, VI, huh, then I, I win zero if I win. That's not good. I want to win some positive number, okay? So the way to do it is to make your bid a little bit less than VI. You don't bid your true value, but a little bit less. And then you win some money. Then you gain some. VI minus BI is greater than zero. But how much less? So here it gets kind of complicated. There's some intuition here. Huh? Here you have to understand like intuition. If you bid very close to VI, your payoff will start to go down to zero. But if you bid too low, then somebody else might win, so you lose your chance of winning. So somehow there's a trade-off, okay, between these two forces. And it depends on what you know of the other bidders. So now it starts getting complicated. It's not just my true value. I have to imagine what do the other bidders know? What are they going to do? If there's a lot of bidders, many bidders, then probably on average they're going to be, there's going to be somebody bidding higher. So my bid should be higher. Okay, that's already one thing. If there's many bidders, it probably should be higher. Okay. So it, it's hard. So there's no simple way to bid. So first price options are not used so much, really. They're almost not used because it's because it's very hard to know what to bid. What you do. It depends on the other bidders. In second price, we don't care about the other bidders. It's very easy. You bid your true value. Okay, so first price is there's it's not so easy. Okay. So that's all I really want to say about first 
surprise. Now I'm going to mention a few other things, but mostly uh, just to explain kind of intuitively. I'm not going to give you any other proofs. There's another kind of auction called all pay auction. This is where you always pay. If you lose, you won't. Your payoff is not zero, but negative. If you don't win, you have to pay BI. You always pay. But if you win, then you get PI minus BI. This happens a lot. So, for example, a lobbyist is doing all pay. So the lobbyist wants some law to be passed so that his company can gain a lot of money. So the lobbyist is spending a lot of money uh, on, on helping the politicians. But many lobbyists are doing different things. Only one of them is going to win, the others will lose. But they still spend the money, they will not get that money back. Or a design competition. I want to build a tower in London which competes with the Eiffel Tower, because the Eiffel Tower is, a, is making Paris much too famous. We need a tower in London. So I make a design competition, and many firms make, uh, propose a design, so they spend money, okay? But only one of them is going to get the actual contract. But they all spend money, even if they lose. So this is called all pay. It's where you always spend money, even if you lose. Your payoff is not zero. Um, or a research project. This one I know very well. So I spend a whole month writing a proposal for getting money from these technocrats in Europe, okay? And I send in the proposal, uh, but uh, out of 10 proposals, only one is going to be funded. The other nine are getting zero. But I spent a whole month working on it. What do I get for that? Nothing, except I spent a month of my time, which is costing money. So the losers always have to pay. So all pay auctions are kind of first price auction, okay? Okay, again, you, you have to be careful because you're always, when you lose, you always pay. So you have to be careful how you bid in something like this, huh? There has to be some reasonable chance of winning, huh? Otherwise you don't, you don't do it, huh? Okay, the final thing I want to talk about is the winner's curse, but I think we're maybe too close we're to the end. So the, the up to now, you got... Uh, so I will talk about the winner's curse next time, but let me make a summary. Okay, seal bid second price. This is the one, okay, this is the best. And it's used a lot. And Google has made a huge amount of money on this, okay? And the bidding your true value is the dominant strategy. That makes this one very easy. Huh? It doesn't mean you pay your true value, huh? You're paying the second. But bidding is the maximum you're willing to pay, yeah? That's the bid. That's dominant. That means it's, it's the best, no matter what the others are doing. That makes this one very easy to use, okay? So this is the best. And we actually, and we made a proof of this, so which I recommend you go over very carefully to understand it. And then there's other kinds of options, first price and all pay, uh, which are harder uh, because if you bid some very high value, you might actually have to pay that very high value so that's not very nice. So you have to be very careful with the bid in the first price. Huh? And all pay is a variation of that, huh? where, where the payoff is negative when you lose. Okay, so let me, let me stop here today, and next week I talk about the winner's curse. This is a very neat thing, uh, which happens when you have not private values but common values. So let me stop here. Let me let you think about second price. Okay. So uh, let me end here. Should I write it up? Uh,